Good evening, everyone. My name is Vignesh Kovinanan, and I'm the programmer with the Asian Film Archive. I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's talk titled Cinematic Truth in Abbas Kiarostami's Films. This is the second talk we are presenting in conjunction with retrospective Abbas Kiarostami that has been taking place at Odin Theatre since 10 July and will conclude this Saturday, 28 August, with 24 frames. The last film that Kiarostami made before his passing. Some of you watching this might have joined us a few weeks ago on 5th August when we had critic and writer Godfrey Cheshire as our main speaker in discussion with local filmmaker Tan Bi Tiam as they took a bird's eye view on Kiarostami's career and his influence on global cinema. If you'd missed it, you can watch the full recorded version of that talk at any time on AFA's Facebook and YouTube pages. Tonight's talk will take a more in-depth approach, zeroing in on the notion of truth and realism within Kiarostami's filmography. Helming this talk will be Hossein Hoshoja. He is a visiting professor of art and art history at St. Mary's College of California in the USA. He has taught a wide variety of film studies, art history, visual, cultural studies courses at St. Mary's College, and as well as other universities and colleges. His essays and reviews on a broad range of topics from film history to exilic autobiography to the history of American higher education have been published in film and cultural studies journals. He is the co-editor of the 2011 Arab Studies Quarterly Special Issue on Academic Freedom. His book on Abbas Kiarostami entitled The Singular Cinema of Abbas Kiarostami is forthcoming from Bloomsbury Publishing later this year. The talk will be roughly around 35 to 40 minutes, after which there'll be some time for questions and answers. Please post questions that you would like to ask Professor Hossein on the comments section of this video on either Facebook or YouTube, whichever that you're watching from. And you can post them at any time during this talk. Without further ado, it brings me great pleasure to introduce Professor Hossein. So good evening, everyone. Thank you, Viknesh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to actually read from my talk with some more of a formal reading. Uh, there will be images, but not clips. I just wanted to mention one thing because uh, the last film you're going to see is 24 frames. And I saw the debut of uh, 24 frames two years ago, three years ago, uh, was edited by uh, Kiarostami's son, Ahmed Kiarostami, um, who lives in the Bay Area where I am, um, you know, situated in. Um, the first image, uh, Peter Bruegel, the elders, Hunters in the Snow, is a perfect, um, you know, overlap between Kiarostami as a filmmaker of the people and, um, and Peter Bruegel, the elder. And, you know, I wish I could, we could talk about that, but my talk is about something totally different. I also have behind me a poster, and I thought that I would share it with the viewers of this lecture. It's the last poster that was printed after the last talk that Kiarostami had at Kanun five years ago. So, you know, I am, you know, kind of, you know, as a, uh, 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 commemoration of Kiarostami. I am displaying that poster in the back. Okay, so let me start my talk. Uh, it will consist of an introductory contextualization of Kiarostami's cinema, uh, putting his, uh, you know, a little introduction to his career, uh, professional career, and also um, a little bit of, um, um, you know, contextualization within the context of Iranian cinema, uh, it will take eight to 10 minutes. And the rest of this are concerned with um, philosophical concepts such as authenticity and truth that I will discuss. And you know, like any other speaker, I would say that this is a work in progress. And actually I got very excited to talk about these concepts and I'm thinking about at some point, Polishing them and publishing them as uh, as a as a as a as an essay somewhere. Okay, so let's start with uh, this um, you know this little introduction, uh, and I call it autorial singularity or defining the frontiers of a national movement. Um, to begin with, I have read, watched, and written about Kiarostami for a long time. I have met the man and have. 
both translated for him and talked to him as part of my book project on him. Uh, words that I will never use in conjunction with Kiarostami in relation to Kiarostami are words such as deceptive, simple, deceptively simple, realistic or neorealistic, but in a naive, innocent manner. These are you know, kind of like oversimplifications that distort and mystify the sophisticated, philosophical, artful, painterly, multi-layered, and multifaceted cinematic world of Abbas Kiarostami. His worlds are constructed to problematize and deconstruct common sense and received wisdom. What the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, and I feel I will refer to him a few more times tonight, uh, in his being and time, uh, he calls them the they. And by they, they I mean T-H-E-Y, calls them the they. They're sort of like unknown masses, those, those from whom we receive the uh, received wisdom. Uh, the dayness of things, the linguistic conventions and social norms, and contrast with the one self, that, you know, the one person, the individual. Particularly in the case of truth and authenticity, the themes of this talk, Kiarostami's cinema has a very interesting take on truth, arriving at truth only through the lie. And I will talk, you know, elaborate this point and therefore completely recalibrating and readjusting its conventional definitions of truth as fixed and somehow transcendental, which you know, is not what Kiarostami is after. I'm not stating that the realist cinema of Abbas Kiarostami does not rise above everydayness of reality to seek more noble truth, to look for, the, uh, you know, to look for what we call the nature of things in themselves. Uh, but uh, but there is there is something else. There is another layer in the uh, deconstruction. Uh, so to seek more noble goals, such as obligation to others, empathy, kindness, but it finds them as things that unfold in our actions, not as pre-given uh, shape of social relations. Okay, so let's start the uh, the the brief introduction. Uh, as I was asked the first time I spoke to Viknesh, and I'm going to particularly thank him at this point in my talk for inviting me. That's a you know really great honor. Uh, I will provide the tiniest, smallest biographical and professional background for Kiarostami, and then I will talk about this more high-fluted uh, philosophical um, aspects of his work. Uh, born in 1930, 1930 and academically trained as a graphic artist. Kiarostami started his filmmaking career in 1970 with the establishment of the Institute for the Intellectual Development of Children and Young Adults, Kanun Parvarish Fekri Kudakan va Nojavanan, or Kanun for short, and in the same year produced Kanun's and his own first film, Bread and Ali. Uh, making films for the next 24 days at Kanun with Through the Olive Trees in 1994 as his last collaboration with the Institute, a state-sponsored institution, both before and after the revolution, uh, he freed himself from commercial concerns. When, when he was working there, he freed himself from commercial concerns of film industry, cultivate, cultivating a bold style uh, with an eye on um, uh, I toward formal and narrative experimentation. Actually, to call him an experimental filmmaker is not quite accurate. Experimental work has the aggressive connotation of a rejection of popular forms and structure by subverting them into new and un unexpected works. Kiarostami did not so much subvert popular commercial cinema conventions as much as he searched for his own cinematic language by circumventing standard narratives and avoiding established academic and professional practices. Experimental also has a modernist notion, a connotation of rejecting Western realism. Um, uh, Western realism in favor of a modernist or avant-garde aesthetics. 
And even though there were Iranian artists like Arbi Avanesian and Bahram Beizai who were consciously developing an experimental modernist aesthetics, I should also add the name of Parviz Kimyavi to this group, uh, Kiarsen was clearly not responding to Western modernism and was developing a different kind of aesthetics and sensibilities. I'm not saying that he was not aware of it. It's just that his films were not responses to this. He was the first Iranian filmmaker to employ only non-professional actors or non-actors, Nabazi Garan, for short and feature films. He was also the first filmmaker who rejected the common practice of post-production uh, dubbing of sound, uh, preferring uh, the then crew technology of sync sound recording over the convenience of sound studio recording for grounding the mistakes, stutters, and non-eloquence of, voice, of the voices of real people. Uh, in the place of polished voices of trained professional voice actors. Uh, his film Traveler is the first one with this thing. And that's kind of like very, very late in the game, but that was common in most places uh, that were not the US. Um, he also avoided standard sc screenplays and instead developed a collaborative method of expanding a minimal storyline of only a few pages um, to a full screenplay during the production, utilizing the characteristics of the chosen location and abilities of his actors as a guide. The result were non-commercial short and feature length narratives and documentaries that were poetic. Uh, poetry in, is an essential part of his style, both in visual and literal senses original and innovative um, and were marked by a light and unforced touch, his films were. Shot on location, these modest, subtle, and humorous tales of everyday people with little dramatization or sentimentality. These films were mostly situation-driven. Actually, they gen were generated from the site as opposed to the other way around, which you look for a site and then, uh, I mean, you have a story and then you find the site were made with non-professional actors and improvised dialogue. In a sense, he became the first true auteur of Iranian cinema, someone who directed, wrote, edited, and cast his own films. The, these decisions were partly due to his lack of formal film education. That's kind of like the characteristic of, um, of people with no experience, people that, you know, like Orson Welles inventing their own cinema. And I'm not comparing him with Orson Welles, even though there is you know, nothing wrong with doing that. It's just that um, he, al he also invented his own way of looking at the world. Um, and also his reliance on a steady but very small um, budget, guaranteed budget. However, they were also in part uh, conscious decisions based on his philosophical and aesthetic standpoint. In the subsequent years, he became an integral part of the non-commercial part of um, part of national cinema of Iran and made a number of short and feature-length fi fictional and documentary films. However, it was not until 1987, after the release of Where is the Friend's Home, sometimes translated as Where is the Friend's House, Friend's House, uh, Friend's House also became the breakout film for Iranian national cinema. I briefly discuss some formal aspects of Kiarostami's post-revolutionary films, including the subtle combination of naturalism slash hyperrealism and formalism. In fact, Kiarostami was constantly looking for cinematic ways outside of a conventional film language, even as, at, at the start of his filmmaking career in 1970. Of course, it took many years for some of the sensibilities that were hinted at in the beginning to mature and develop into coherent and recognizable style. What was exciting about Kiarostami's work is that while he was developing a unified film form and style, he rarely repeated himself. That's very interesting in Kiarostami's cinema. Uh, we may use the term auteur to refer to his work to somebody who uh, is in complete charge of the way that he makes his films uh, and he does his work, but uh, there's also the fact that you see this variation, not just repetition of the same. Um, every, work was connect every work was connected and at the same time different from the previous one. He likened his approach to a novelist who would write one book in his entire life, 
um, but would only release individual chapters at the time. A short comparison of two films with similar themes illustrate the above point and exemplifies the kind of subject that in interests Kiarostami. In Traveler, a 12-year-old boy from the small town of Save concocts an uh, ingenious scam by taking pictures of his classmates with a broken um, camera um, in, in order to make enough money to travel to Tehran to attend his favorite uh, team uh, soccer match. Some of you might know because most of the uh, most of you might be from Asia. That's Persepolis. So Persepolis was his favorite film. So he wants to go to Tehran to watch Persepolis to uh, play in the main stadium. I'm a fan too. Uh, when he gets to Tehran, he falls asleep and misses the game. Uh, actually, the you know the concept of soccer is constantly brought up in his films. From and life goes on to every other film in which you actually. There is something soccer themed. Maybe it's the gameness of it that was interesting to him. Um, when he gets to Tehran, he falls asleep and misses the game. In 1990s close up, a hybrid of actual, factual footage and reconstruction of events with the real characters, Kiarostami decides to investigate the case of an out of work printer. And I'm going to speak, uh, say more about uh, close up at the end of this talk. Uh, who has been arrested after pretending to be the famed Iranian director Mohsen Mahmoud charged with attempting to defraud a family, the Ahan Khas, who had taken him into their uh, house believing that he was the real Mahmoud Bav. He had promised the family that he would um, make a film. So remember the empty camera, the empty camera of the traveler. Uh, so pretending again. And in both instances, the actual film is generated. The empty camera of the young boy in uh, Traveler and Mahmoud Wolf's promise. But I'm going to come back to this later. So it is not as much, you know, an empty promise as it is. Uh, it is. Uh, it is a pointing out of the uh, the paucity, the scarcity of images. That you know, somebody like Sabzion, uh, Sabzion a member of Mustaz Afin. Um, um, an Azari uh, Turkish member of the Mustaz Afin, an out of work printer, is experiencing. He had promised the family that he would make a film using the family as his cast and their house as the location. In his trial, Sabzion denies the charges of fraud and claims that all he had ever wanted in his life uh, was to make a film uh, of his suffering, suffering in life, therefore taking so much pleasure out of portraying a film director and assuming his identity and power. Kiarostami convinces, uh, and all of this, uh, this on film, um, um, I, I, this is all on film, all parties, they accuse the victim, even the judge, to agree to, be, uh, to replay the parts. Even more importantly, Kiarostami manages to cast the principles as themselves in this reenactment. The difference between the two films is more than just the more complicated, um, complicated formal structure of close-up. What has significantly changed in that 17-year span um, is that Kiarostami has acquired an appreciation for the power of cinema in everyday life. Uh, but as I will discuss, uh, yes, there are many people, including Wem Wenders, including Werner Herzog, including Scorsese, who would refer to Close Up as the greatest film ever made ever about filmmaking. But in fact, it's actually a film about reality. How do we actually, how are, how are we capable of uh, portraying a truthful image of reality uh, that would be adequate? to the events themselves. And I will talk about the strategies that he uses. The difference between the two films is just more than that, um, that uh, has acquired a new appreciation of the power of cinema in everyday life. At the end of Close Up, Kiarostami arranges the real Mohsen Mahmoud Bok to pick up Sabzian. And uh, when he's released from jail, after his short term, Mahmoud Bok takes uh, the, then takes Sabzion to the Ahan Khas for reconciliation. Now, I will talk about the fact that the technical issues at the end of the film has something to do with Kiarostami's philosophical approach to truth. Okay, so after that brief introduction, I will make an attempt to place him within the larger context of Iranian cinema. 
to call him an entirely tangential and peripheral filmmaker at the time when Beyzai and Mehrji were defining Iranian cinema, and that's an accusation, that's a characterization by Hamid Dabashi, uh, whose book uh, by the name of uh, Close-Up Iranian Cinema makes this claim, completely misses the point by reducing the artist's impact on national cinema uh, to his commercial success. As I stated above, Kiarostami was entirely funded by the government agency before and after the 1979 revolution and never really had to rely on private investors to make films. This is a significant fact, not being in, uh, dependent on private investors and profit-oriented institutions freed Kiarostami to make to a frame from the market forces. His filmmaking practice clearly reflects the non-commercial nature of his films and at the same time, it's entirely wrong to according with a special status outside of national cinema of Iran in the form of an international auteur divorce from the forces of his own national culture. And this is the last paragraph that I'm going to dedicate to, you know, his, the overview, and then I'm going to get into the discussion on philosophical concepts. A brief survey of recent Iranian cinema that have been exhibited in, inter, inter, in international film festivals reveals that the kind of aesthetics that Kiara Sami has been had been developing uh, for the past 40 you know 40 odd years 50 years now 51 years you know five years since his passing um, when he started was 1970 um, um, four years marks a large number of films from Mahmal Bov's films of the mid 90s. Uh, Mahmal Bav production house films like Samira Mahmal Bav, Ayrza Davud Nejad's uh, Sweet Agony and The Need, Rakhshan Bani Etemad's Made Lady. Many other examples demonstrate a set of formal and stylistic decisions based on the use of non-actors, improvised dialogues, sync sound recording, on location shooting, and also self-reflexivity. Uh, films about, you know, about the, the role of cinema in Iranian society. And moreover, their narrative structure too was a hybrid of documentary and fiction. Therefore, we may claim that Kiarostami's works have originated and developed within a national cinema that has created space for an alternative, um, uh, space for an alternative cinematic language uh, to the dominant uh, narrative uh, tradition of Hollywood cinema, as well as European art cinema. Ac accusations of uh, making films for film festivals, you know, by Iranian critics like Sohrabi and uh, Farahmand, that's Nagme Sohrabi and Azad Farahmand, for example, have to explain how film festival politics have worked to shape a film culture uh, so coherent with such a long history. More significantly, why exactly this kind of cinema, one that has little potential for commercial success? I have to finish this observation by emphasizing the fact that we need uh, that when we speak of a national cinema, we should remember that far from a homogeneous field of representation, we are speaking of a comp compartmentalized, uh, try to say that at four in the morning, compartmentalized cultural field that houses several uh, competing and oppositional practices. Okay, so let's get to our topic. I mean, to the, to the meat of the argument. Uh, let's get one more thing out of the way, maybe our own ABC Africa, the preamble that grows to become the whole text. We all love Abbas Kiarostami in our own special way. Like many other great artists, and I include many literary figures, theater people, uh, filmmakers, uh, also filmmakers in this group, we, some of us, maybe all of us, feel that Kiarostami is directly addressing us, that he grabs those ineffable moments and feelings that we have. Um, that we experience daily at some point and frames them into recognizable linguistic phrases and uh, psychological geometry. We have those aha moments, those, you know, Eureka, oh, uh, aha moments in the conversations between Mr. Badi'i in Taste of Cherry and Mr. Baghiri, the man who plans to commit suicide and uh, uh, the man who works for the Museum of Natural History. Uh, Ahmad's uh, premonitions and trepidations in Where's the Friend's Home. Remember, as he's looking for his friend, Mohammad Reza Nehmati, uh, the point of view transforms into his point of view. So we see, you know, big pieces of cloth, uh, you know, or clothing fall on him. 
uh, he sees uh, uh, mules in the in alleys from up above, you know, actually from down below. So, you know, we, you know, we become, he becomes our surrogate um, set of eyes. Uh, or Hossein Sabzian's courtroom confessions, meditations in close up. The conversation between Manya Akbari and her son Amin in tent. Even the moral dilemma, dilemma of students in the first case, second case has the same uncanny, um, use the Freudian uh, term, unheimlich, which means something that's both very familiar and also very strange. Quality of being both quite familiar and strangely new, most often epiphanic, you know, are present in his films. Like all great artists, filmmakers, and writers, uh, from Vincent van Gogh, Dostoevsky, Antonioni, um, all, the works are all very specific and rooted. Uh, painting of a plain bedroom, desperate, penniless student named Raskolnikov, the madness of Juliana in Antonio's Red Desert. There's something very specific and singular uh, in these films. And same thing happens in Kiarostami's cinema, that singularity. That seems to resonate universally. So there's this universe resonance of something very specific. Had he started, or any of these artists, actually had started from recognizable types as opposed to these odd and singular characters, that resonance, universal resonance, would have been completely you know, washed away. Um, any teacher in... Um, Senegal, in France, Japan, Singapore, would recognize the class dynamics, moral duty, and the troubled relationship between adult, adult world and children is where is the friend's home and homework. It is precisely this delicate and solid balance between the singular and the universal that constitutes a major part of the appeal of Kiarostami cinema. Yours recognize it as intimate and personal. But when he, we look at his, uh, their reception from a distance across the national borders, we all can see that the films span cultural and historical differences and appeal transnationally. Now, let's address some of the universal dimensions of Kiarostami cinema that arise when we experience a feeling of uncanny familiarity and enlightenment in our experience. I use phenomenological terminology here and usually speaking about, when I usually speak about films. By that, I mean, instead of saying that films of Abbas Kiarostami are this or that, I say that what is it like to experience a Kiarostami film? What does it all have to do with the cinematic truth to answer this question, let's start with a certain sense of authenticity that most viewers experience and identify in his films. Now, it's obvious that there are also those who are either at best indifferent or at worst hostile to Kiarostami cinema. It's not our concern here. And I do take them up in my book. Let's, you know, just move on to the argument. One dimension that one dimension that of that uh, authenticity, what we call authenticity and Kiarostami cinema, has to do with location shooting. In fact, the location often generates the story, no, no, not the other way around. The constant use of non-actors, sometimes stammering, sometimes eloquently performing their improvised dialogues and or unexpected turns and twists, the breaking of the wall of the cinematic illusion, they all contribute to their feeling of authenticity. They're all part of it. Mr. Ruhi breaking the fourth wall and acknowledging that he cannot open the door to the house, um, his cinematic house, to give Puya, the director's, director character's young son, a glass of water since the cinematic house is not actually his and just a pretend house. I will come back to this, you know, Actually, I won't come back to this scene later because I will, you know, won't have time. But for now, let's just say that instead of a Brechtian, Godardian bearing of the device, the alienation effect, the where from Dunk's effect, the alienation effect, you know, kind of like distancing the uh, spectator. Uh, in Kiarostami's films, spectator experiences a warm, funny, authentic moment of truthfulness. Uh, you may sometimes hear, and it is true, that in Iranian performative traditions like Tazye or Shi'i Passion Play, some of you might be familiar with that, it is common that the actors would break character and ask for a glass of water or have a casual conversation with each other 
or, other, or the people outside the stage. This blurring um, of diegetic and non-diegetic worlds is understood as part of the theatrical reality. No one is actually going to object that such and such character broke character. Um, ex uh, it is expansive, it, its expansive world uh, traverses the stage at the end of proscenium and extends into the consciousness of the spectators as well as their physical space. It is not an audience in front of a performance, per se, of actors on a constructed mise-en-scene, but rather a performance comprised of actors and spectators and kind of the blurring of the line between stage and the rest of the proscenium. Um, this is not a rhetorical flourish. It's an accurate description of a performance as well as event that requires a certain kind of collectivity. No wonder then that one of Kiarostami's most ambitious uh, non-cinematic installation project was his sixth channel, Tazie. This is an account and a quotation from a July 14th, 2003 Guardian review of the installation. Um, his open air hexagonal wooden theater has a central stage surrounded by a shallow tiers of seats. Uh, above all are six screens on which we see the faces of Iranian spectators watching a previous performance of the same version of Tazie. The effect is a curious one. We watch the play, a version of ourselves. This, says Kiarostami, is the idea. Tazie is strictly linked to, the audi to its audience. And the event is actually created by the rapport between actors and spectators. Okay, end of quote. According to Kiarostami, this, says Kiarostami, is the idea. Tazie is strictly linked to its audience. The event is actually created by the rapport between actors and spectators. So this was from uh, Lee Marshall in Guardian, and I thank, uh, thank him for that, uh, for this apropos quotation. Let me return to the idea of authenticity. Uh, to borrow another term from Heidegger, the world of Kiarostami's films similarly point to and delight in their being in the world, the so-called Dasein, without rehearsing what would take the entire talk, you know, to set up. Okay, I'm going to skip that, you know, setting it up. Let me just say that if you were to take up any contemporary philosophical def definition of authenticity, Heidegger's um, argument might be the most concise and appropriate for Kiarostami's film. Let's summarize it as standing up for and standing behind what one does as owning up and owning up to one's deeds as an agent in the world, becoming uh, something that becomes impossible in this sort of resolute commitment for the sake of which of one's existence. This definition of authenticity as finding the balance between our everydayness, uh, what Heidegger calls thrownness, being thrown into the world and going along with what is, what is common on the one hand and finding the time in our moments of reflection to look for the true glimpses. Uh, and I'm going to ask Riknesh if um, I could have a few extra minutes, like, you know, three or four minutes. Um, um, I, I'm uh, thrown into the world and going along with this comment on the one hand and finding the time in our moments of reflection to look for, um, to look for the true glimpses into uh, the most important questions regarding, um, regarding, uh, our being, our existence, thinking for ourselves into the questions such as what should I do, what can I know, what can I hope for, what am I? Basically, the three questions that Kant, Immanuel Kant, um, puts forward as a way of inquiry of you know of our the way that our our existence works. The authenticity that that, uh, that we feel about the films of Abbas Kiarostami constantly raise these three questions these questions without being heavy handed. Consider the case of his 1978 film, um, Solution Number One. A young male driver finds himself with a flat tire. He has no spare. As he gets, uh, gets a ride to the next gas station to get the flat tire fixed, uh, um, you know, he is stuck there. It's a no dialogue, but not silent. There is ambient sound and later upbeat music on the soundtrack. Uh, an 11-minute fiction film, roughly 
the first half of the film is dedicated to the exposition, diagnosing the problem, fixing the tire, making the failed, a failed attempt to hitch a ride back to uh, his car, um, tire in hand. Once determined uh, there will be no outside help coming, the young man starts rolling the tire down the mountain road back towards his car. Solution no uh, number one is not only uh, is not the only Kiarostami film that poses what should I do? What can I know? What can I hope for? What am I? Uh, the image of the young man rolling the tire on the road in the tunnels and on the edge of the precipice, both part of the world and ready and willing to go uh, to, uh, to own and own up to his own deeds, is an agent taking control of his um, ordeal. What I, call, what I called above his thrownness, finding himself in a situation that needed his resignation and exertion of his agency. I see that I only have four minutes. I'm going to skip the rest of the authenticity and say something about truth. And I think I'm just going to, you know, take up another five or six minutes to just make my point about truth. Okay, so how does all of this relate to Kiarostami's account of truth? So I skipped over part of this, but I will make the uh, the talk available to everyone to see the parts that I skipped. How does it all relate to Kiarostami's account of truth? Uh, historically, the philosophical tradition standardly conceives of truth as attaching to proposition, as involving a sort of correspondence between proposition and state of affairs. Friedrich Nietzsche takes a radically different stance. He asks, then what then is truth? A movable host of metaphors, metonyms, and uh, anthropomorphism. In short, a sum of human relations which have been practically and rhetorically intensified, transferred and embellished, which after long usage seem to people to be fixed, canonical, and binding. Truths are illusions which, have, uh, which are, have, we have forgotten are illusions. And I'm going to just uh, stop here for this quotation and just say a few things about Kiarostami's films. This passage is from an unpublished essay by Nietzsche titled, um, titled On the Truth and Lies in a Non-Normal Sense um, that, was that was eventually published in 1987. It has been upheld as an influential essay for postmodernism. Um, Nietzsche asks whether language is an adequate expression of all realities. To this, he points out that the arbitrary nature of language as a collection of metaphors, um, for example, when we use the word snake, we pretend that the word is adequate not only to correspond to different differentiations of 3,000 species of snake, but millions and millions of actual snakes in the world. Now, I know that many of you are thinking of you know, sem semiotic concepts, but let's just skip this. So this is more about questioning the um, questioning the nature of the thing itself. Uh, very, very provoking thought, uh, thoughts, but I wanted to take just a few more minutes to use an example from Kiarostami. And, um, and I apologize for ev from everyone that I did not time it correctly to be able because I need another 10 minutes to finish this. I'm just going to spend another five minutes and you know, say a few more things. Nietzsche is not denying that we need language to communicate, but sees it as a very inadequate description of the real. What is even more annoying to him is that we take concepts of language to the equivalent of truth. Very, very provoking thoughts. But I want to add one more thing that is directly related to our discussion of Kiarostami and truth. Nietzsche calls image the first metaphor. It is this ontological status of image that, make, that makes Nietzsche's ma uh, manner of thinking about truths and lies particularly compelling in relationship to Kiarostami's cinema. Let's return to a statement by Kiarostami, and I want to emphasize that we should not necessarily take on, you know, accept on faith everything that artists say themselves. Statement by Kiarostami about lying to get to the truth. On the one hand, he's describing his own filmmaking process. We choose a woman to play the wife, a man and to be the husband, a young boy to play his son. In real life, we have, they have no relation. But in a filmic setting where the viewers knowingly, knowing that these people are strangers to each other in real life, accept their cinematic truth of their familial bonds, tensions, loves, anxieties. But what is the cinematic truth that everybody believes? 
uh, it seems to be a conventionalized account of any of these concepts. At the same time, he's using the term lying, not as in a moral uh, or moralistic sense. Um, the, uh, the cinema, his cinema is ethical, but not in an absolute moral terms. Ahmad, Ahmad ba uh, Babak Ahmad, poor named Ahmad in Where is the Friend's House, spends the entire evening looking for Muhammad Reza Nehmet Zadeh's house to return uh, Nehmet Zadeh's homework notebook to him. He even braves an implied beating by his father. But ultimately, what the spectators identify with is his staying up late to do his friend's homework. For him, in other words, it is the cheating that generates the emotional response that May we many identify as truthfulness. Uh, another interesting example, and I'm going to finish with this, um, in, in, uh, interesting instance that happens in documentary, in the documentary, it happens in the documentary homework in the series of short interviews with a group of first and second graders. In a short interview perfectly titled Lying About Homework, Ken, uh, Kenta McGrath explores the idea and compulsion of lying in homework. It's a film about homework, or so Abbas Kiarostami tells a group of schoolboys who approach him on the street and ask what he is filming. Have you done your homework? Kiarostami asks them in return. A resounding yes, and off they go to school, where the director and the crew will soon, uh, soon join them. So immediately, so immediately after the start of the film, lying by the director and the subject start this delicate social cultural dance. Um, so now let me squash one cultural stereotype here. I actually have a section here that I talk about a cultural tradition in Iran called Tarof. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to continue with the um, to 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 uh, homework. Just finish up my thoughts on homework. Kiarostami isn't even able to broach the topic of homework with Majid, the last boy to ap appear before the camera. The poor kid is an anxious mess from the outset, crying for his best friend to be alongside him for protection, apologizing for no reason in particular, and most tellingly, keeping at his arm's length uh, throughout the ordeal, something a teacher has taught him to do when seeking permission. Kiarostami isn't a teacher, but he may as well be one for Majid and other children. He actually kind of stands in for the authority, for the figure of authority, symbolic figure of authority. Like a teacher, this man already seems to know whether they have done their homework or not. And like a teacher, he has the power to pull them out of the class that they don't understand into a room full of strange men and their strange equipment, the significance, um, the significance of which they don't understand. All Majid knows is that Kiarostami belongs to the adult world, in which, uh, in, which, uh, in which belong the men and women who punish children for not doing homework, which is why Majid cries and why the children cry. Um, I actually have an entire section on close-up, and I want to just read the conclusion to that section. I thought I had, you know, time did right, but it didn't. Uh, I'm just going to read the conclusion to close up. Um, in close up, I actually, let me just tell you what my argument in close up is. Close up, which is about, uh, you know, the construction of the story of Ahan Kha and Sabzian. Actually, I talk about the two scenes, one scene, the, the opening scene, the other scene in the, uh, towards the end of the film. And in both scenes, we actually break, Kiarostami breaks down the, uh, the, 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 the story itself by keeping uh, Faraz man the, uh, and the taxi driver uh, outside of the gates of the house. We, don't, we never go into the gate, into the, inside the house in the first sequence. And when we are inside the house, we actually have no idea what's happening there. So by breaking apart you know, this narrative structure, he is pointing out the constructedness of this. So let me just read the conclusion. Um, I also point out the one last event in the film, I believe would be an appropriate ending for these observations. The final scene, the moment that the real Mahmal Bov picks up Sabzian at the end of his 40-day jail term, 
um, seen in a long shot from the point of view of a filming van, we learn that Mahmal Bof's lapel mic is worn out and intermittent. The entire conversation between Mahmal Bof and Sabzian becomes a compassionate, loving, stuttering conversation. This stutter will eventually become a piece of lyrical music. Remembering, uh, remembering, um, uh, remembering citing Nietzsche, I brought up the move from first metaphor, the image, to the second metaphor, language. Here in the modal rights scene, the language turns into the less restricted and more open metaphor. To conclude, these examples were in Where is the Friend's Home, Homework, and Close Up, remind the viewers of the nature of truth as metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms. Through various narratives and formal strategies to highlight the forgotten illusions by pointing out the forgotten links between reality and truth. If there is one incontrovertible truth in close-up, one that is not for a forgotten illusion and is only generated through the sheer existence of the film itself, it is Sabzion. It is that Sabzion turns out to be not much of a fraud after all, since he does deliver the film that he had promised Ahan Khas in his return as Mahmal Bof, the filmmaker. And I apologize for both going over my time and also not being able to read the whole thing. It was, you know, I calculated that 18 pages should be done in 36 minutes. I was wrong, so I apologize. Thank, thanks so much, Hussein, for that, for that uh, amazing talk um, and for, you know, contextualizing Kyrostami cinema in, in such varied ways from Western philosophy to Iranian cultural traditions. I think these are some approaches to his cinema that uh, many of us may not uh, have, have, have encountered. Um, and so, I mean, and I'm, and I'm sorry that you didn't get to, to, to finish your talk as well. Not your but, fault, um, not your fault, my <laughs> fault. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, for those who may not know, actually, Hossein is, uh, is, in, is, is in Pacific time right now. And he's actually, it's actually uh, close to 5 a.m. Uh, he got up especially for this. Uh, I was, didn't go uh, to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I really appreciate it. So I think at this point of time, I'd just like to remind viewers out there who okay. are watching that they, uh, you can post your questions, any, any questions that you have based on uh, the talk that Hossein just gave, or if, you, uh, or if you'd like to know more uh, from his point of view, his perspective about Kiristami cinema, just type your questions onto um, the YouTube or uh, Facebook comment section that wherever that you're watching it from. And we'll be able to, um, uh, you know, pose these questions to Professor Hussein, and he'll be able to answer. Uh, but while we wait for people to do that, maybe you know they are still formulating their thoughts. Okay. Uh, I wanted to go back to something about. Uh, I was very fascinated about the Iranian cultural traditions that you had mentioned in your in your mm. talk. Um, I think Kiristami himself has often cited other forms of art uh, as as a big influence on him, as opposed to other forms of cinema. Yeah. Um, and and he himself started his artistic career as a painter, an illustrator, and, poet. and so and poet. Um, and, and he you know he, and and he wrote poems poet. throughout his his life as well. Um, and these notions of realism and truthfulness are are very much embedded in uh, in in visual culture and cultural traditions across uh, the world and across time. Uh, and and what I found especially fascinating was uh, what you brought up about the, uh, about Iranian cult, uh, theatrical traditions. Mm -hmm. um, and and I remember there was another cultural tradition that you wanted to to speak about, but you had you said you didn't have time. I'm wondering if you could expand on it now, perhaps. Would love to. It's yeah. uh, the, the the cultural tradition is called uh, ta'aruf, and it's an Arabic word, but it doesn't have the Arabic meaning that it would have in Arabic, which I think it would be just pleasantries. It's basically a series of cultural interactions um, among large groups of people or between two people in which you actually exchange pleasantries. For example, you offer, let's say that you're having coffee, uh, you're, you're in a coffee shop with friends and somebody, some distant acquaintance is going, going by and you would invite the person to join you. But it is not meant as a, as a, real, um, uh, as a real offer. It is just a pleasantry. So these comes from the long historical traditions of hospitality especially in a place that's arid and uh, you know cities are distant from each other and the traditions of hospitality actually developed in a very particular ways so you have to show hospitality to people that you know or you don't even know 
because you might be in the middle of eating your food and you would offer your food to someone. Now, the thing about taruf is that both parties know that you have to offer and you have to refuse. The refusal and offering this sort of a minuet, this dance, is understood. It's implied, okay? Problems arise when somebody doesn't understand that it is actually meant as this. Now, by this, many Iranians outside of Iran, people who have been distant from their, you know, historical roots might, you know, look back at this and call it a deceitful, um, you know, tradition. The, what makes it not deceitful is that it's usually for tempering the cultural, for moderating and tempering cultural relations. And all parties know that there is a certain sense of, you know, certain sense of exaggeration at work. I, I remember actually Zizek who had in, encountered this, uh, you know, traditions. Like, it's like going with, you know, a group of people would go with a very rich friend to dinner, and everybody would offer to, you know, to mm -hmm. pick up the check and pay for the bill. But ultimately, the rich friend is supposed to pick it up and pay for it. Okay, mm -hmm. but if you don't make the offer, even though when you make the offer, everybody says, "Oh no, don't, don't, don't," you have to make the offer to have the to make the gesture. Now, this I think sometimes is confused for the fact that the culture itself is deceitful. It is not about the deceitfulness of the culture. These are the cultural traditions that were designed at some point in order to mitigate conflict, to provide hospitality. It's a much deeper. Uh, so there is this anthropologist, uh, Ziba Mir Hosseini, who's made a film called uh, Divorce Iranian Style. She actually writes very eloquently about Tarof. Okay, so that was a tradition that I didn't have time to. I see. So it's a certain cultural performativity, but both people know what the rules of this performance. By, by knowing the rules and obeying the rules, mm -hmm. no one would be inconvenienced. Okay. Right. So, yeah. but everybody would be, you know, it actually kind of uh, adds a, a veneer of, mm -hmm. uh, of respectability to, mm -hmm. to, the, to, to social I relations. And and just to uh, ask a bit more, I mean, because I'm very personally very curious about this. Uh, and th is this an enduring uh, tradition to to yes. today? Yes, okay. yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. You know, you travel to to Iran, to any city in Iran, Tehran, Kashan, Tabriz, wherever yeah. you go, and you get into you you know, let's say that you hire a cab for the day. So you you know you basically hire you know uh, uh, rent a cab and said like okay I'll, I'll and you ask the person how much would it cost and he will says oh nothing for you nothing <laughs> you, i will be at your disposal all day and it would take at least 10 minutes before you set a price okay because it would be rude abrupt and kind of uncivilized to immediately talk about you know to set the set a set a rate for the yeah. for the for the right so you have to go through this. So you actually have to tell them that I'm, you know, I live out, I live outside of Iran. I live abroad. <laughs> Why don't you just tell me how much it costs yeah, yeah. if you don't want to go through it? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. You have to actually say, I don't know Tarof. So yeah. Why don't you just tell me how much it costs? Right, so yes, right, right. It's an enduring tradition. It's mm -hmm. a very complicated, even people, you know, politicians on TV from the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it doesn't matter how politically antagonistic everybody is. Taro yeah. is part of the you know, part of the language, part of the uh, physical gestures, offering mm -hmm. your seat to someone, offering someone mm -hmm. to join you. It is part of every aspect of life. Yes, I see. Yes. Well, that, that is really quite quite amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I also want to. I guess people are quite shy to ask questions. Um, no, there are, no remind, questions. there are no questions. Uh, I just want to. I just want to uh, Thank encourage you for and getting the conversation going. No, no. I mean, uh, I just want to encourage uh, anyone who's watching to to please type in your questions. Um, uh, anything, any questions you might have about Kiristami's films, about the talk you just heard, uh, and you know, we'll we'll post them to uh, Professor Hossein. Um, I, I do have another kind of. Uh, uh, question or, or topic that I'd like oh. to delve in. I remember in one of our earlier conversations, Hossein, we were talking about the portrayal of children and mm -hmm. childhood 
uh, in Kira Stormy's films. And uh, you had said that this is something that you are yes. currently researching on uh, for p possibly a publication in the future. I, um, I, I and finished I'm, that. I finished that. Oh, I, fantastic. It's yeah. So, it's a book. Okay. Chapter. Okay, so I think, I mean, if you're comfortable to, to talk a bit more about that. I'm absolutely comfortable to talk about yeah. this. Um, yeah. I guess because everybody has seen, you know, many people have seen most of the films by Kiara Stami, you will notice that uh, starting in 1970 all the way through the end of the 80s, even a few years, you know, toward, you know, end of the 80s. Okay, so let's say the last of those films was Where's the Friend's Home and Homework. Okay, in the and life goes on, and through the olive trees, you're actually dealing more with the adult world. So, adult world after 19, 1990s. Um, but in any of those films where you have actually children, and this is not just Abbas Kiarostami, um, making my discussion is actually the scope of my discussion kind of traverses, goes around the scope of the entire Iranian cinema of the 80s and 90s, in which the films are child-centered. So it includes films by Abbas Kiarostami, the ones he made for Kanun uh, about children, films by Amir Naderi, like The Runner and um, uh, Water, Wind and Fire, uh, films by um, uh, Rasulov, like The Iron Island, um, Bahram Beyzai's uh, Bashu, The Little Stranger, on and on and on. There were, there were you know, large group of films about children. Now, there was is kind of like a reductionistic, cynical reading of these films as somehow getting away from censorship, that making films about children would allow the filmmakers not to deal with the more serious adult topics. And I think that's an you know, oversimplification and even um, kind of an avoidance of what these films were really about. And these films happening in the 80s and 90s were actually about a very dark and, you know, kind of like a really uh, a dangerous world in which these children lived in. These films, like, where's the friend's home? You see that the world that surrounds Ahmad is a very menacing world, okay? Bashu, the little stranger, is a war refugee from the south that ends up by the Caspian Sea, all the way across the country. The runner is a homeless kid. So these kids actually live in the, you know, in these very brutal and uh, and very uh, uh, merciless conditions. So there was one other thing that seems to contribute to making films about children. Uh, in 1990, I'll just give you one set of statistics. Uh, 25, 75% of Iranian population were under the age of 25. So only 25% were, you know, were adults in a, in a sense. So you had this phenomenon of youth explosion that seemed to create a sense of angst and anxiety and, and um, unknown, you know, in, 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 in Iranian society. And as an extension, culturally reflected in Iranian cinema and TV series. Now, my argument is that by the end of the 90s and the beginning of 2000s, you had the emergence, the appearance of a series of films uh, about uh, lost, alienated, unemployed, angry youth, people in their late teens and early 20s, films like Boutique, films like... Um, uh, uh, like the girl in uh, in sneakers, uh, films like I Tarane and Fourteen, etc. These are about you know these transitions from adolescence to uh, to youth to maturity, and you know the the world seems to be kind of like a transition of the previous generation to this. It wasn't a change in the filmmaking scene. It wasn't like filmmakers now dare to make films about you know real serious issues. It was actually the same generation having come of age, and now they were confronting these issues, these very serious issues of survival, existence, meaning of life, um, uh, the, the, the grass being greener on the other side, migration or, you know, escape, all the things that seem to be the themes of these films. 
So my argument is that, first of all, we should take children's films seriously. The world of children is not a miniaturized version of the adult world. It's about the real problems of real of children. Okay, those films actually address those issues. You know, any mm -hmm. film that we see from that period, most of films that we see from that period reflect this. And we actually have to see that the cinema, the national cinema, kind of grew older, not grew up, um, grew older along with the same generation of the filmmakers. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Professor Hussein. Um, uh, unfortunately, we've we not had any. No well, I, yeah, maybe people are a bit shy. But uh, well, in case if you if anyone thinks of any questions that you'd like to ask, you can always uh, email AFA or you can uh, also um, look for Professor Hossein from the St. Mary's College. Uh, and you can, you know, his email is up there on the website. So you can also email him your questions. Um, but, you know, I would, I would like to call this uh, current session to a close and I'd like to, oh, we have, we have a question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there we go. Um, okay, uh, we have a question here, a last minute question. Okay. Uh, from Mihal Biergansky. Okay. Uh, he says, I would like to hear about comparing uh, Kirisami's films and other arts. I know there are lots of uh, landscapes and he loves that topic in both films and photos, but are there similarities? My, my assumption is that Michael is um, asking questions about other arts practiced by Kirisami. So am I, yeah. it's not just Perhaps, other yeah. art in general. So yeah. I assume that he says like, how is he expressing what he cannot express in films in still photos? or his mm -hmm. installation. So uh, let's just consider what he had other than films. He had museum installations. So something like five dedicated to Uzu that I assume you showed uh, mm -hmm. was not intended as a cinematic screening or Tazie was not intended as cinematic. They were installations, six channel installations, etc. Um, the, the, the photographs, uh, the, you know, the, the, the trees, um, etc. Um, also, you know, they were part of his art practice and his poetry. Um, in, um, you know, I will start with the, uh, photo his photography. He, uh, photography was something that he had done since, you know, b even before he had, you know, started making films. As a, you know, gr graphic artist, a painter, he was also kind of like a trained as a photographer. So his photog he always had his still camera with him whenever he was actually, you know. But one thing about his photography that you notice, uh, similar to many other artists who are interested in, in uh, repetition and seriality and finding the minute differences in those, you know, serial images, you see that in the work of Kiarostami as well. You actually see his series of works of, um, of leafless trees, for example, um, or doors, or whatever, you know, was, you know, or seeing the world through rainy um, window, windshield of a car. You see that he actually, similar to an artist like, um, um, like, like Monet, Monet also loved to paint the same site, same location, with different lights of the day. And this actually kind of points out to Kiarostami's own understanding of the world, that the same thing that you're looking at different times of the day is never actually the same thing. There is a difference and it is our responsibility as sen you know, sensitive and sensible people to identify and recognize that. In poetry, he actually experimented with different forms of poetry. He has seven volumes of haiku, for example. But he also experimented with, you know, rewriting and reciting the poetry of classical uh, Persian uh, poets like Hafez and Saadi and Molavi and Qayyam. Um, I guess what he was looking for was the contemporary resonance of these um, poets that where you know the, the 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 most recent one was six seven hundred years ago. Okay, so he's looking at this tradition of poetry starting a thousand years ago, eleven hundred years ago, all the way to you know contemporary poets. But most of the poetry that he was 
interested in was the classical poetry of six, seven hundred years ago, Hafez, Saadi, etc. And first of all, finding the contemporary language for those, but also finding the resonance and the influence of those in our consciousness. So that was you know, another thing that he was really interested in. With Tazie, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, he was not particularly interested in the passion play or the story of Tazie, as he was interested in the, in the, in the communal feeling of Tazie as something that involves an entire neighborhood, an entire city. How this performative tradition is not just about, you know, the what is portrayed on stage. And I, I've heard, I've seen like similar things in India when they actually have. You know, this uh, in in you know uh, Hindu tradition, they have the same stories being repeated again and again and again. And the you know the locals who come to see the 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 play, they you know they participate in parts of it. So he actually was more interested in the pa participatory access. Also, remember he did a lot of other things that usually we don't talk about. For example, he um, he directed uh, a version of Cosi Fantuti by Mozart on a London stage. So he was always looking for a new experience in which he would, in, in which he would actually look for new forms, new modes of expression. Great, thank you. Thanks for that question, Michal. Uh, we thank have another you. question, but it's also quite, quite similar to what Michal yeah. just asked. So I think you, you covered uh, you know, quite a bit of that. Um, but yeah, I think with that, uh, I, I would like to call this session to a close. Uh, thank you so much, Professor wanna... Hussein, for, for joining us today, uh, for <laughs> waking up you know, so early or not sleeping at all, uh, and for preparing this wonderful talk for us. Um, and you know, we hope to, to have you speak at a at a future at, a, at another uh, future event sometime in the future. And, and remember, um, next time that I'm there, remember don't trust me on the time. Yeah. <laughs> Give me an yeah, hour. I'll, I'll, Give me an hour so well, I'll, I'll I'll tell you a time shorter there so you can you can. Yes, uh, you yes. Can... <laughs> trick me, trick me. Yeah, I will I, deceive you. Yeah, yeah I guess <laughs> deceive me. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you for inviting me, and I want to thank everybody who was here. Uh, watching this talk. So I'm very grateful no and I'm, I'm very humble. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone. And um, goodbye and uh, good night. Yeah. Bye-bye. Take care.